Summary and Analysis the main point of this work is that when we listen to people talk about morality, we have to slow down and think about where these moral ideas come from, really think about the people who are presenting those ideas, and not allow ourselves to be manipulated or gaslighted. Gaslighted? Gaslit? Gaslighted. Our ideas of morality, like most of our worldview, comes from the material reality of our lives, and because of this, our moral ideas are very much shaped by class, which means moral ideas are inherently political. Oftentimes, the moral ideas that are most popular in society are the morals of the ruling class, and that means that things that people think are universal morals are actually ideas that enforce the power of the ruling class. For example, and this is my example, not one from the text, in the modern United States, along with most other capitalist countries, we have this idea that people have the moral right to own property and do whatever they want with that property. It doesn't take a genius to see that this idea serves rich people more than it serves poor because you know, some of us have more property than others. It's a moral idea to get people to accept capitalism and to get people to accept the fact that few people get to own a lot of things while others get to own little or nothing. It's an idea that reinforces our social hierarchy. So when someone tries to make an argument to you appealing to universal morals, that should give you pause because are those morals really universal, or are they serving a particular set of interests, serving a particular agenda that benefits a certain group of people? Because, in reality, since morality comes from society, and since it comes from people, it's kind of impossible for morality to actually be universal. It's always a reflection of the people who produce those ideas and the time and place where they lived. Another thing that the text asks us to think about more carefully is the idea of common sense. Common sense, like morality, comes from society itself and is a reflection of a certain time and place in human history. Because of this, common sense can't really be universal either, because it ceases to be relevant the moment society experiences any drastic changes. Another thing to think about is the idea of ends justifying means. A lot of people seem to think that if we allow ends to justify means, that means we're amoral and scheming and we're willing to do all types of evil things to get what we want. But the truth is, every single person in the world bases their moral choices on their end goals. Usually their end goals reflect their class interests. And also, since the ends that we desire usually are in themselves means to other further ends, it's kind of silly to separate ends and means from one another in the first place. The question isn't really whether or not means are justified. The question is if the end itself is justified. And then we can consider which means are necessary to reach that end. So the question remains, if any particular moral philosophy comes from a particular group of people in a particular time and place to serve a particular set of interests, what are our morals as communists? Well, the time and place that we come from is modern industrial capitalism, which is a class-based society. And we, the communists, come from the working class and our interests are to serve the working class. We need to live by a moral code that serves the interests of working people, and our end goal should be the liberation of working people. And so Trotsky leaves us with this little take-home message that we can bring into our political activity and maybe even our daily life. That which is moral is whatever increases the power of man over nature and abolishes the power of man over man. In other words, things that lead to a world where human beings can be happy and healthy and live in peace and equality with one another. This contradicts sharply with the end goals of the ruling class. 
who want above all to preserve their own power and privilege, who have brainwashed the rest of society to believe morality means serving the ruling class's interests. And that means that we communists, sometimes we will be morally required to do things that mainstream society views as being immoral. It means that we may have to break some rules and fight dirty. We have to be okay with the fact that the most powerful voices in society may morally condemn us. We have to be okay with the fact that we are rebels. And it is okay because it means that we have unlearned the lies that we've been hearing our whole lives. It means that we, at the end of the day, are serving a higher moral cause that the ruling class doesn't want us to think about. It means that we have learned to disentangle their morals from ours. Now, I don't necessarily agree 100% with everything expressed in this work. First of all, anarchists. I am so sorry. Trotsky hates you. I do not. Yeah, we may disagree on some important points, but you're fine upstanding comrades at the end of the day. And when it comes to doing important, difficult work of class struggle, walking picket lines, communicating with the workers to raise class consciousness, harassing Nazis on the internet, you have our backs. Trotsky in this piece is also trying to defend himself from moral outrage directed at him about some decisions that he made as leader of the Red Army in the Russian Civil War, which perhaps were questionable. I don't really know the details of these accusations or if they are true, but I do know that his goal in leading the army was to defend the workers from the imperialist capitalists who were trying to reassert their power. And I really do not want to think about the awful violent vengeance the capitalists would have enacted upon the workers if the Red Army had lost. But is this a good enough reason to let him off the hook? That's a difficult question to answer, but it's certainly a question we need to think about carefully and honestly. In the final section, Trotsky lays out some criteria about how to make decisions in morally gray circumstances. Our goal is the emancipation of the human race. And the question to ask when making a moral judgment is whether or not a certain act will actually realistically serve that goal. We avoid acts that will do more long-term harm than good, and all of this we consider in the context of what's going on in the current moment. I think this is all a very roundabout way of saying think things through before you do them, and carefully consider what the effects and consequences of your decisions will be. Most importantly, the take-home message I got was that we shouldn't let our judgment be clouded by the opinions of people who don't necessarily have the best intentions or who don't really care about the well-being of the working class. I think that's pretty good advice. And so that, in its entirety, was their morals and ours. If you want to leave a mean, nasty comment about how annoying my voice is, you don't have to do that, I already know. But I would like to know what you think about this text and the messages contained within it. And also let me know if you want more story time on this channel, and maybe give some suggestions of what to read next. Thank you for listening!